Hello everyone and welcome to another Callisim webinar. Uh, my name is Laura and today we are very excited to have Lucy Goff and Dr. Graham Glass with us. Dr. Glass is an attending plastic and craniofacial surgeon at Sidra Medicine and an associate professor of clinical surgery at Will Cornell Medical College. He studied both medicine and physiology at Glasgow University and obtained his PhD at Imperial College London before embarking on postdoctoral research as a lecturer at Oxford University, where he continued his research work into novel stem cell therapeutics. In tandem with his research work, he completed his plastic surgery residency in London before embarking on specialist training in craniofacial surgery at the renowned Great Ormond Street Hospital, as well as prestigious fellowships in head and neck microvascular reconstruction, facial palsy and aesthetic surgery. Dr. Glass has published over 45 peer-reviewed papers, several textbook chapters, and has lectured nationally and internationally. Lucy Goff is the founder of Luma Laser. She started the company following her own battle with septicemia, whereby after meeting with a number of specialists, she realized that most of the supplements she was taking had little to no proven benefits. Once being put on a course of proven peer-reviewed ingredients, she was quickly back to herself, and this was where the idea of Luma was born taking proven, patented and effective medical innovations and making them accessible to consumers. The Lima mission overlaps with our vision at Calisim of taking patented cutting edge medical technology and making it accessible to the market. And we are pleased to be a partner of Lima's. The presentation will be around 40 minutes long and then we'll have a 15 minute live Q&A. If you do have any questions during the presentation, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question there and we'll answer them at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Glass and Lucy. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm gonna to talk about optimizing out of clinic patient skincare, which is uh, a topic that is uh, both very interesting and very uh, potentially uh, diverse in, its, um, in, in the things we can talk about. Um, so my name is, uh, thank you very much, Laura, for your, your wonderful introduction. My name is uh, Graham Glass. I'm a, a plastic surgeon. I was based in London. I'm currently based in Qatar, and I have an academic practice as well. Uh, I work on a medical college, which is in New York and, uh, and Qatar. I'm a member of the American Society of Plastic Surgery and a member of the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Reconstructive Surgeons and the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Um, I do have a research background as well. I completed my PhD in 2010 in stem cell therapeutics at Imperial College. So first of all, the post-treatment problem. Well, as we know, there are effective skincare regimens available in clinics. The problem happens when patients leave clinic uh, and for that period between when they leave clinic and when they come back to see us in clinic again. In particular, the issues with uh, downtime and uh, recovery. There is a period after any uh, treatment, whether it be invasive or non-invasive, where there may be uh, reactions to what has been done. There may be some bruising, some swelling, some inflammation. Uh, and this is the period between when the, there's an initial reaction to what has been done, but before the, the, the beneficial results are manifest. Um, this is a period which is of concern for the patients because, and clients because this is a period where they have yet to appreciate any of the, of the benefits of what has been done um, on their behalf, um, but they are experiencing some of the difficulties, the downsides. And it's when they um, often question the, uh, the, the choices that they've made to do something. And sometimes they can look around for other options as well. There is inevitably a post-treatment dip. So this is the period after the downtime and recovery phase has, uh, has finished, but before the benefits uh, are fully manifest. And again, this is a period where patients and clients often wonder about whether they've done the right thing. They sometimes seek second opinions. They look elsewhere for other uh, treatment options and other ways to 
uh, fully maximize the benefit of what they've had before they come back to clinic again. This often drives them to often ineffective out of clinic self treatments. There is a huge amount of advertising that goes into uh, picking up this market, a market that is saturated essentially, and um, a market that is saturated because it's potentially very lucrative, because there is a gap between the uh, the the um, benefits that are and the uh, promises. And people can get caught in the trap of expensive and unproven uh, self medications at home. Equally, one, one of these things is topical skin care. So the topical skin care market is um, essentially very lucrative for those involved, but there can be in many ways gaps between the, uh, the, the, the science backing up some of the claims and the, uh, and the quality of a product provided. This all leads to the idea that there are diminishing returns, that there are, um, that they, uh, when a treatment program has uh, finished, but before the patient comes back, they experience benefits, but every time they have a treatment, those benefits are, um, the perception of those benefits diminishes with every uh, occasion. And this also adds to the idea that um, patients wish to look elsewhere for other solutions. So, oh, beg your pardon. If we move on to the next. Thank you. So I would argue that while these are post-treatment problems, they actually um, have the potential for post-treatment opportunities. Um, and if we look at each individually, one of these things is accelerated recovery. Well, if we know that downtime and recovery is an issue, then there are things that we can look at into trying to uh, diminish some of the um, deleterious manifestations of the treatments that we give in order to uh, see these benefits ar uh, arrive at faster. Also sustained benefits between uh, the treatments. The idea that um, the results should be prolonged um, with uh, the, uh, by minimizing the time, uh, the latent period between the time that a treatment is given and the, uh, the positive manifestations of it and the prolongation of those positive manifestations. We must look at effective evidence based at home skin care. Uh, these are uh, the, th this, as I said, is one of the most saturated areas, but it's also one of the areas I would argue that, that there is greatest opportunity in. And there's greatest opportunity because there is a big gap between the uh, potential be benefits that we can provide in this domain and the benefits that are out there at present with some uh, of the, uh, the, the, the poorly evidenced at home devices. These are very expensive. And in order to establish and maintain good relationships with our clients and patients, we want to avoid our patients having unnecessary expense. Uh, we want to shield them from some of the um, some of the hawkish um, uh, the, the advertising that's out there where there really is a gap between what is promised and what is delivered. Ultimately, we want durable results because durable results uh, have better outcomes and ultimately happy patients. So the industry has changed, but the industry is changing. Um, the Consumers definitely want beauty on their terms, the, both in and out of clinic. The um, challenge that presents itself is to produce something that is out of clinic, which is as efficacious uh, uh, as what is able to be uh, provided in clinic. Consumers do want the, this dip in the quality of, of, of what is uh, available for them. One of the things that's helping this is that the uh, device market is being cleaned up by 
legislation and regulation. But this is a slow process, and it, it, it's it, it's piecemeal and variable in different countries. Um, there are new breakthroughs in science and technology. It's it's often easy to feel jaded about the idea that there are um, that, that there are new op opportunities for scientific discovery out there. But I think that's only because it's easy to look at it's it, look at things today without really evaluating where we've how far we've come and um, in, in a relatively short space of time if we consider that in the 80s we had growth factors in the 90s inflammatory modulation in the zeros uh, stem cells and the tens peptides and then the 20s who knows the the market is evolving and the and the science is evolving with it there are new uh, the, the opportunities for new entrants to take a, a paradigm shift, if we like, in, in what is available out there in order to uh, some, produce something which is drastically different and drastically better than what is uh, than, than what's available at present. And here really uh, brings us towards uh, what we think is, is, is the present and the future, which is out of clinic, but clinic grade uh, device so there is no reduction in what is uh, possible between the clinic and the home setting. So one of the things <clears throat> that is clearly uh, topical and has been for about the past five years is photobiomodulation. I'm not going so far as to say that photobiomodulation is going to be the scientific breakthrough of the 20s. It's interesting that <clears throat> uh, it was actually discovered in the late 1960s and early 1970s. But like many scientific discoveries that were ahead of the time, the clinical potential of this wasn't realized. In fact, those who identified it didn't really know what they had on their hands. And it's uh, it's taken 60 years really for the clinical potential of this, this incredible phenomenon to be, to be uh, identified and uh, clinically exploited. <clears throat> If I was to say what photobiomodulation is, well, the, 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 the scientific basis for bio, photobiomodulation goes back way beyond the 1960s. I would say that the origin is actually uh, Sir Isaac Newton's first law of conservation of energy in, that was published in 1687. And what he said was that there is no, that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be changed. Well, if we look at, photobiomodulation in that context, then what it really is essentially is the conversion of a very specific kind of light energy into intracellular chemical energy. Um, and so this has been known for over, over 300 years. What is new or relatively new is the idea that the cell can alter its behavior depending upon the intracellular chemical energy stored within it. If we take, for example, the humble fibroblast, uh, fibroblasts uh, present in the dermis create collagen and extracellular matrix uh, proteins for, um, for, for durable and uh, supple skin, then um, it has been discovered that, uh, that, that an increase in intracellular energy within the humble fibroblast causes the genes within that cell to switch to a more reparative and regenerative uh, form. So um, the, the, the cell signals are causing the production of more collagens, more extracellular matrix, and turning off the signals that are responsible for age and senescent decline. And that, that truly is an extraordinary thing when we think about the, uh, the, the, the potential that that has. Let's look at uh, low level light laser therapy, which is the application of photobiomodulation in clinical practice uh, in the context of other commercial techno uh, cosmetic technologies. Well, we're all familiar with, uh, with ablative lasers. Ablative lasers are high powered lasers that create such as CO2 laser, which creates a very focal thermal insult. Now this, uh, in doing so, it brings about an inflammatory response and the inflammatory response in, in turn brings about tissue repair and regeneration. 
It is high power. It is only available in a clinic setting. So some of the alternatives available for home use. Well, laser, low-level laser therapy uh, is a very special kind of light. It is monochromatic. That means that the light that is produced is all of one wavelength. But in addition to that, it has a number of other features that have recently been identified as being incredibly important in what uh, in photobiomodulation actually does. One of these things is that it is coherent. So all of the uh, wavelengths of light are, um, are lined up identical to each other. It is collimated. So they're all in the same orientation and it is polarized. Now, um, quite <laughs> in essence, what that means is that the light waves are in the same geometric orientation with respect to the source. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because it's been identified that it is some of these features of light which are responsible for some of the features of photobiomodulation, particularly something called laser speckle. Now, what laser speckle uh, means is that the, is that the collimated, monochromatic, coherent, polarized light passing through a medium does not lose energy in the same way that it would if it didn't have these features. In fact, what happens is that as it passes through a medium, it interacts with the uh, with the molecules within that medium. Is that there are focal areas of amplification of energy, and it's these focal areas of, of amplified energy that are that have sufficient energy within them to drive uh, the production of intracellular chemical energy and hence the re cellular response that uh, we know as photobiomodulation. This is a fundamentally different thing from LED light. Now, where LED uh, comes into this is that um, in the 1960s, 70s, now the 80s, as they began to become aware of the potential of using laser light uh, to induce cells to do uh, certain specific and special things, uh, there was the development um, of, of light emitting diodes. Now, light emitting diodes is something called, uh, it works on a principle of electrofluorescence. So the passage of light through a particular medium causes light of a particular wavelength to be formed, um, which is fundamentally different from say a light bulb where the light is formed as a result of heat energy uh, uh, through the passage of a current against resistance. It was discovered that uh, these light emitting diodes, depending upon the, uh, they, they could be of quasi monochromatic nature. And this was of interest commercially because low level laser therapy was predicated on the idea that it was monochromatic. At the time, they didn't really understand that the monochromatic side of it was only part of it, that actually the polarization of light, the, the coherence, the, um, the, the collimation were equally important. So commercial uh, entities began putting two and two together and, and producing uh, uh, devices based on LEDs, which were cheap and abundant and did not produce heat and relatively safe um, it, for what they called low level light therapy, which, which was based on extrapolated preclinical data, uh, largely based on lasers. What we now know is that LEDs because they don't have the same uh, light characteristics, what happens instead is that as LED-based light passes through a medium, it is absorbed by the medium and the, uh, the energy rapidly diminishes to the point that within a few millimeters, it is of insufficient energy to drive any kind of uh, cellular response. The, altern the other alternative is that the laser diodes now laser diode uh, is, uh, which are also at home medical devices, again, are fundamentally different because what they do is they produce dermal heat. Dermal heat produces inflammation, inflammation drives tissue repair and regeneration. So it's a very non-specific thing. Um, another alternative is microcurrent. Now, microcurrent is the passage of a small electrical current through 
uh, through the medium of, uh, of the dermis. But of course, what we know is that from electricity is that electricity takes the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance in organic tissue is nerve and to a lesser extent muscle. And the passage of an electrical current through, um, through tissues that have more resistance to them, such as bone and fat, uh, causes heat as a byproduct. So it's a very non-specific thing. So this is a summary of some of the alternatives I've kind of talked uh, through uh, these individually. Um, but the, uh, the, we have microcurrent, we have LED based light, we have home diode lasers, and we have Lima's laser, which is uh, a fundamentally different technology, either to the home diode lasers or to the infrared or near infrared LED uh, light masks. If we were to summarize what the Lima laser does, we can summarize it using this diagram. Uh, in, in a very basic sense, the highly penetrant uh, near infrared light uh, produces a higher energy content of fibroblasts. These fibroblasts are induced tissue repair and regeneration and the production of collagens and elastin. Excuse me. Um, the collagens and elastin and extracellular matrix proteins plump up the dermis, if you like, um, because one of the features of age is that all of these products, the, the, the content declines. Um, in addition, it increases blood flow. Increased blood flow brings uh, cells into the, uh, including stem-like cells into the dermal microenvironment in order to drive, help drive this process. Now, TIMPs are the, uh, MMPs are the matrix metalloproteinases. These are enzymes which break down collagens and extracellular matrix proteins. TIMPs are the inhibitors of these enzymes. As we age, the ratio of MMPs to TIMPs increases. So in other words, there is a progressive drive towards breaking down uh, collagens and extracellular matrix proteins in excess of the inhibitors of, this, of these breakdown enzymes. What um, near-infrared laser light does is, um, and these are th these, these enzymes are produced by inflammatory cells and, and to a less extent by fibroblasts too. But what near infrared light does is it changes the balance. It increases the inhibitors of metalloproteinases and decreases metalloproteinases. So in other words, we're almost fooling the dermis into thinking we're young again, and the dermis goes back to work to producing uh, the extracellular matrix proteins that make young supple skin. This also happens in the, to, to, it drives keratinocyte turnover, which is the epidermis. And a higher keratinocyte turnover is responsible for youthful looking uh, skin on the surface uh, or skin that, that's sometimes described as glowing. Melanocytes are the cells which use melanin. Melanin is the pigment. And one of the most interesting features about the near-infrared laser light is it regulates the production of melanin by melanocytes um, and regulates the production of melanosomes, which carry the, um, the melanin to the keratinocyte, the keratinocytes, the basal layer. So in other words, it in theory evens out pigment irrespective of skin color. Both near infrared and blue light increases nitric oxide, nitric oxide increases blood flow. Um, the other thing that near infrared laser light does is it, it alters the, the cycle of androgen mediated hair follicles. And it drives them towards the anagen phase, which is the phase that where, where they grow and produce hair. Now, 
this is a fundamentally different thing from turning one kind of hair into another. So it's not as though uh, near infrared laser light is going to make uh, thick hair from very fine velous hair, and it's not going to make fine velous hair grow. This is simply the the, the androgen mediated type of hair, which um, is uh, particularly head hair all over the hair, uh, all over the head in women, and in the particular male pattern in in men, and um, and that's why. Uh, even though the very first experiments use it, looking at photobiomodulation cause hair to grow in mice, uh, they, they do not cause hair to grow uh, in an unsightly fashion or unnecessary fashion in, in, in humans who have a fundamentally different hair follicle structure. Now, added to this, the uh, blue and near ultraviolet uh, light that the Lima laser has, it is an LED. And the reason it's an LED is because the, the site of action is very superficial. The site of action is actually the Propionibacterium acnes, which is a bacteria which is present on everyone's skin and is responsible for pimples and acne. Now, Propionibacterium acnes produces fatty acids. Um, and there is good evidence to show that blue light actually causes the, uh, a change in some of these fatty acids to a molecule which kills the, the, the bacteria. So um, one of the most interesting features about blue light is that while it doesn't cause some of the other things that near infrared light does, it actually causes the propionibacterium to kill itself. This in theory is helpful for uh, skin care and uh, complexion. If we want to know in a bit more detail how all this happens, this is my diagram from one of my papers on the subject, and it summarizes all the scientific evidence to, um, uh, uh, to date on how photobiomodulation actually works. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, please feel free to, to, to take this away and have a look at it. But in summary, it works by, uh, and th this is a diagram of the skin with the epidermis, the dermis and the subcutaneous fat. It works by, um, by upregulation of certain genes, by the production of growth factors, by inflammatory modulation, uh, and by the alteration of the um, reduction oxidation state within the uh, cellular microenvironment, which uh, it is um, a very clever driver of a kind of tissue repair, reparative and regenerative process. And this is all happening because of the increase in the, the, the energy component of certain key cells. Um, uh, in the absence of heat. And I think that's, uh, that's very important and that's why it's different from some of the other technologies available. So if we look clinically at some of the, uh, the, the, the before and afters here, we can see that it, it, it works really on a whole range of things from uh, pimples. The pimples, um, as I said before, are it's the blue LED light, which is mainly targeting the propionic bacterium and helping to kill the bacteria. But the near infrared laser light fundamentally alters the inflammatory microenvironment. So these things are synergistic. The inflammatory microenvironment, by converting everything to, to a relatively anti-inflammatory microenvironment, and this is, if anyone's interested, it's actually, um, the, molecules called uh, interleukins, uh, interleukin 1, 6, TNF alpha, and actually in, in the anti-inflammatory interleukin IL-10, it actually alters the, the balance of these. And a negative, a, a relatively anti-inflammatory environment is also useful in terms of reducing both pimples and, and rosacea. Uh, in terms of scarring, Facial scarring is different. Facial scarring is because of uh, focal areas of, um, of the deposition of, of certain types of collagen by scar. 
But as I said, because it, and um, scarring is really a, a dysfunctional attempt by the body in order to repair itself. Scarring is a is a is a quick healing mechanism because in it from an evolutionary point of view, that's what we needed. Um, the one thing it is not is a repair is a regenerative process. But because the laser can drive the regenerative uh, processes within the dermis, it somewhat improves uh, scar appearance. And uh, these are some of the other. Um, so in terms of uh, acute scarring, uh, this is one of the things that I'm interested in as, a, as, a, as an active clinician and surgeon in the management of acute scarring, as well as general tightening of the skin and skin elasticity, which uh, I've explained uh, the reasons why. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to uh, talk more on this and I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Glass, that was fab. <laughs> Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can just type it in, uh, give some time for people to write in if they do. Anything at all. <laughs> Oh. There we go. So there's one question here saying, how often is the device used? Okay, I think perhaps Lucy can answer that. Yeah, so hello everybody. I'm um, Lucy, I'm the founder of Lima. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to Callisim for hosting this seminar and also to, it's a, a true pleasure working with Graham, um, who's now written three academic papers on the Lima laser and we're, we're really privileged to be working with him. Um, in terms of um, how often do you need to use the device, you really need to look at what you want to treat, so different um, different conditions um you, you you have a different protocol but if you were treating um uh, wrinkles say facial wrinkles for example you would um use the device daily for uh, 12 weeks and then um and that would be for if you were treating the um, the face on its own you would use it for a minimum of 30 minutes daily um on your face and then um, you would just use it a couple of times a week um, thereafter to maintain the results that you'd achieved. Uh, if you were using it for, um, for a scar, for example, um, you would um, carry on using it daily, but for five minutes on each section of the scar that you wanted to treat until the scar had gone. Obviously, if it's, um, if it's a keloid scar, this will take longer than three weeks. Um, it can take about 10 months for a keloid scar to begin to actually go. Um, but if it was like a, ge a, a general um, C-section scar, you would expect that that, um, that, that would go in, in, in about 10 weeks. Amazing. There's another one here, Lucy, that says, how does the near infrared in the Lima differ from that in Saluma? Yeah, so Saluma is an interesting one because they are categorically stating that they are that they offer low level laser technology and they don't it's LED so their devices do not have lasers inside they have LED inside which is very diff which are two completely light uh, two completely different light sources as Graham's explained they're they're one of a number of um, of companies that are citing evidence from low level laser therapy, um, but using LED technology, which is completely different. Um, Dermalux is um, it is just LEDs as as well. Um, so uh, it this, doesn't work in the same way. This is a very unscrupulous uh, aspect of, of the the commercialization of light. 
Um, just to, to give you a bit of further background on this, LEDs were actually, um, one of the drivers for LED uh, light was NASA. And what they were interested in doing was growing crops in space. And uh, the, so in the 1970s and 80s, they were looking at, the, uh, at how to generate artificial light through the passage of current in such a way that did not generate heat as a byproduct. Because uh, th this was very important for the idea about, about growing crops in space and long-term space missions and so on. Um, of course, what they found was that they could create light uh, just about any different, by altering the, the, the product within the LED, they could create light of just about any wavelength. Uh, it was incredibly cheap uh, and it didn't require a lot of power to use it. So this was, a, um, uh, th this was a kind of product that was waiting for somebody to, to, to use it. Now, simultaneously, um, this laser-based photobiomodulation uh, became, um, uh, you know, be became something that was of interest within the academic community. And, um, uh, and really, some manufacturers took the quantum leap to say, well, look, Let's forget about laser because that's, it's too difficult to create a, a, an at-home commercial uh, laser for this. We're going to use LED instead. And then we're going to cite all the papers from uh, the, the basic medical science papers that use lasers. These were helium neon lasers. They were diode lasers. There were various lasers that, that produced uh, red and near infrared light. And we're going to use the, the, this as the basis to justify the use of, um, of these LED products that we're going to say does the same thing. Um, I think I've shown from the, the, uh, the, the talk that LED light and laser light is categorically not the same thing. And it's not as though this has just been discovered. Um, it was Mester back in the... Um, who was one of the pioneers in this in the early 1970s, uh, who was looking at some of the, the, the unique properties of laser light, realized that there were other features about the laser light in addition to the monochromaticity, in other words, that the fact it was a single wavelength that was responsible for some of the incredible things that they were seeing in the preclinical studies. So LED, laser, not the same thing. And, um, and other companies that that claim they are are are, are, um, are shall we say are, are really um, sorry are really uh, stretching the truth. Um, so the next one is um, contact dermatitis. So basically, you shouldn't use any form of light therapy if you've got um, a fungal infection but it can be quite helpful for many different types of dermatitis, not all types of dermatitis, but um, many different types. Um, in terms of when you can start using the laser after surgery, um, you can literally, uh, you just wait 24 hours to ensure that there's no internal bleeding. And as soon as um, that's been confirmed by the surgeon, you can use the um, you can use the Lima laser. You should start using it as soon after the operation as you can. Obviously, you need to make sure the dressing is off because it, the lens has got to touch the skin at all times. But you can use it when when the staples are still in. Um, if you've had staples after surgery. Uh, yes, I would. I would largely agree with that. I would say that um, the one thing we've got to, to do after surgery, uh, assuming that you've had a primary closure, is you've got to have um, uh, the epidermal cover. So that, that typically takes place two to three days after the operation itself. So after two to three days, uh, you, you're essentially, uh, your wound should be to all intents and purposes um, watertight, and you can start using the laser then. And actually, there's um, evidence to suggest that if you use um, low level laser technology after surgery, it can prevent um, a keloid scar forming. So it's really useful um, to use after um, any type of surgery. 
Uh, the certifications um, on the device, um, it's available um, for sale throughout the world, except for America, because we are still uh, going through FDA approval. Um, so it's approved for use everywhere in the world outside of America. The FDA approval is a very long process <laughs> that has been going on um, over a year and we're all trying to be very patient but it's actually um you know dealing with the fda is is um is has not been a pleasurable experience we've got another question in the q a box um that says what callison products go with team and laser so which ones are you using do you want to take that? Well, well, I can speak personally because I do use the Callison products with the Lima laser. So I use um, the multi active cream. Um, I mean, I, I, I combine it with other products as well, but um, I use the multi active cream and then the hydrator after that. Um, and it, it, it's um, I find I find it very easy to use with it. Um, you can actually, I mean, th there are no products that interact with the light, um, so you can use you can use um, uh, products that have got um, uh, SPF in because obviously um, SPF does not interact with um, I, the, the IR end of the spectrum. They're, they're two completely different um, ends of the spectrum. You can use it with retinol or, or, or anything really. But no, the Callison products are brilliant. And actually, um, I combine that there's um, two active products that go with the Lima laser and I combine the um, Callison night recovery complex recovery night complex. yeah with the um with, with the the serum that goes with the with the lima laser and it it's um yeah it, it it's brilliant i mean you know targeting stem cells um it, it obviously goes hand in hand with with the low level laser technology so it's very complementary brilliant there's another one there that says, um, is it used mainly for home use or is it used in clinic? It's intended for home use, but we have um, facialists um, and practitioners who were incorporating an LED machine into their treatment who have replaced it, who have replaced the um, LED machine with um, two Lima lasers. Um, so it's interesting. Um, it, we have uh, people, especially that were uh, finishing off a treatment with the Dermalux Triwave, um, that are now incorporating the Lima laser technology instead of that. Because obviously, as more um, education comes um, into the industry and people start to realize the difference between low level laser therapy and LED, it's a natural progression for people to use. Um, in clinic um, and actually interestingly even um, technologies like the bionique laser which uses low level laser therapy inside a clinic um, the lima laser is four times more powerful than even that in clinic treatment um, because it uses continual power it doesn't use pulsed laser energy which obviously makes it far more effective Brilliant. Um, the next one is, does the Lima laser contain two wavelengths or just one? It contains two. So it's 808 nanometers is the, is the infrared laser. It's a 500 milliwatt near infrared laser. And 406 nanometers is the blue LED light. Great. So the rationale for, for, for both, um, as I showed in the talk, is that the is that near infrared for, for near infrared to be effective or at least the, the the scientific evidence suggests that for the near infrared light to be effective it has to be a laser it has to be collimated it has to be coherent it has to be polarized <clears throat> uh, and you don't get that from the led um, it in addition contains a blue led laser 
because the LED is not targeting the same thing that the, uh, that the near infrared laser light is. The, the blue LED is not photobiomodulation. The blue LED is targeting the, um, the, the bacteria contained within the skin and within the sebaceous glands that produce um, the pimples and acne. And, um, and there's good evidence to say that it, it does help kill some of that bacteria and, re and improve, um, and, and improve uh, skin texture uh, by reducing pimples and acne. The, this is supplemented by one of the effects of the near infrared laser, which uh, causes an inflammatory, uh, an anti-inflammatory microenvironment. Um, uh, and so the two, th the two are entirely complementary. And actually, just going back to the in-clinic question, um, this summer, hopefully, it, uh, around this summer, we are going to be launching a bigger Lima laser that will be um, four times more powerful and have um, a, a, a lens that's three times as bigger. Um, and that um, will be available for at home, but it's also aimed for um, in-clinic use. Uh, yes, we do have, um, we, we, we um, have different pricing for, we have a wholesale model for um, practitioners in, um, who want to use the device for um, in clinic. So if you contact us, we'll be able to send that. Uh, I know that Graham can ask, answer the long-term studies regarding developing skin cancer because he's just finished writing a paper on this. Yes, this is a paper which has been a uh, which it has taken a long time to write because the, the, every individual basic scientific study we have to go th through it, um, it, it, establish exactly what it is they, they did to make sure it, it's it's clinically relevant, um, and the the short term answer the, the, the paper is almost finished, but the short answer to this is no. There is no evidence that it causes uh, skin cancer. We have looked at um, three domains. We, we looked at the preclinical uh, evidence by way of in vitro studies. This is studies where you essentially cut your cells um, and you expose the cells to, uh, to, to light. Um, two different types of cells. So uh, in fact, many different types of cells, but uh, the um, normal human cells and cancer cells. So it's important to know, it, it's not just important to know that this doesn't make normal non-cancerous cells cancerous. It's also important to know that it doesn't stimulate the growth of cancerous cells, okay? Because uh, we don't want people to be using this laser who have an undiagnosed cancer and find that it's actually exacerbating the, the, the growth of the cancer. Um, We've also looked at uh, the preclinical animal models uh, that have been published in the literature and looking at the clinical trials, um, uh, or at least all the clinical evidence that is available. And the, the, the short answer is that there's absolutely no evidence that, this, uh, that, that, that the Lima laser causes cancer. Ironically enough, in looking at this, we have come completely full circle because uh, the very first study that identified photobiomodulation as a phenomenon was actually looking at whether near infrared light caused skin cancer. Um, and what they found, uh, and this was using a, a mouse model, they found that in shaved mice, they found that it didn't cause skin cancer, but it made the hair of the, uh, the mouse grow back faster. So having spent 60 years and literally hundreds of uh, clinical studies and preclinical studies later, we've come around to the same conclusion, but I think it's a very robust conclusion and that paper should be coming out at some point this year. Um, thank you, Graham. And then um, the question from Assad about how to convince clinic owners to replace their expensive laser devices with Lima. We're not asking anybody, you know, the in-clinic treatments are in-clinic treatments. And if somebody goes in and wants to um, have a course of treatments with the ND YAG laser, then that's never, you know, we're not challenging that. What we're saying is if somebody goes in to have 
any form of um, invasive treatment in a clinic, then by using the lima laser afterwards, you are reducing downtime and you are also optimizing the um, potential of the results obtained by an in-clinic protocol until the next time that they come into the in, into the clinic. Uh, so the lima laser is not, um, we're not um, wanting to replace any treatments that go on in a clinic. You know, they're here to stay and um, it's as much a form of uh, cultural um, entertainment now, you know, uh, going into a clinic and having a treatment, it's an experience. And that, that's never going to end. And we don't want to challenge that. What we want to do is to help people arrive at their next appointment with the best skin that they can, that they can have. Um, and it was interesting was uh, having a conversation with one of the leading dermatologists in the US. And she said, you know, so many people arrive in my clinic with poor quality skin and expect a miracle. And, you know, I would far rather people come with the, a better quality skin because I can do far more with a better quality skin um, than I can with somebody that arrives with, 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 with a poor quality skin. So this is really marketed as um, an in-clinic treat, as an at-home treatment. The in-clinic laser that we are launching this summer that can also be used at home is really to, to replace the LED machines that are in, used in clinic, which um, the Lima laser is a far superior option. Uh, will we produce a mask? Um, we, we've looked at many different options um, as to how to deliver the Lima laser technology, how to deliver low level laser therapy at home. And um, a mask is something that we are looking at. Um, there are, in order to produce a mask that is um, that, that, that does not get hot and, and there's so many different parameters when, when you're um, diffusing very high powered lasers. Um, it, it's, a, it's a way off um, and that's why we're sticking to the, um, the torch shape that, that we have at the moment. But we have got um, really exciting product developments coming out um, for other parts of the body as well next year. Fantastic. I think that is all of the questions. Um, so if anyone else does have any more questions, feel free to email us at customer service at callison.com. We can always pass them on, on to you guys for your expertise. But um, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Lucy and Dr. Glass, for that. Thank, thank you and, so um, much. Thank you to Callison and thank you also to Graham. And thank you to everybody else for joining. Have a lovely weekend. <laughs> you too. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Dr. Glass. Thanks.